Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, PGC Worldwide Lab meeting, an update from the PGC Bipolar Disorder Working Group. My name is uh, Ola Andreasen and I uh, will host this session. Uh, and the presenters will be Neve Mullins, uh, who will give a quick status from the PGC BD Working Group. Then Kevin O'Connell will talk about overlapping genetic architecture. And then I will end the presentations by a little bit update on plans of the PGC Bipolar Disorder Working Group. And we will uh, have the questions or comments in between the talks. And uh, as you see here on the screen, the Bipolar Disorder Working Group. Uh, so I'm chairing it. Um, and we have an executive team, uh, Ariana DeFour, Andreas Forstner, Andrew McQuillan, and Roel Uphoff. Kevin and Neve, who are presenting today, are the analytical team. Then we have a phenotype group with Andrew, Ariana, and John. And then we have uh, started to build a strong outreach uh, group. Ariana is leaving, leading that. So uh, this is sort of the core team, but then we have a lot of members all over the world. So maybe we can show the, the bipolar disorder working group, which is uh, uh, quite uh, extensive, uh, a lot of members across the world. And we're supported by several uh, international uh, big consortia and funding agencies. So then uh, I'm happy to give the word to you, Neve. You are going to talk about what is the status of the data we have uh, currently. Please. Thank you. Um, so I'll give an update on the uh, PGC3 bipolar disorder GWAS. Um, just to begin, um, this is a reminder of where we're at in terms of published results. Uh, the PGC2 paper was published last year in Nature Genetics and uh, with a sample size of about 20,000 cases, this paper identified 30 genome-wide significant loci for bipolar disorder, including many ion channels, neurotransmitter transporters and synaptic components. The polygenic scores from the GWAS explain about 4% of variance on the liability scale. And another key part of this paper was in highlighting the differences between type 1 and type 2 bipolar disorder in terms of their SNP heritability and their polygenic signal, with type 1 being the more heritable of the subtypes and showing a closer genetic relationship with schizophrenia compared with type 2, uh, which has a lower heritability and shows a higher genetic correlation with depression. So these are the cohorts in the PGC3 freeze. We have about 42,000 cases now and we have 57 cohorts in this freeze. 52 are internal to the PGC and all of them are of European descent. And they include um, all of the major subtypes of bipolar disorder. And here, most of them have been clinically ascertained using structured psychiatric interviews. Apart from uh, the external studies, these are large population biobanks that we're collaborating with. And they have typically ascertained cases using um, ICD codes or mental health questionnaires. So Rikapilli was used to process all of the data internal to the PGC in the standard way. It's all stored on LISA and uh, this time we have updated the imputation to the HRC reference panel. So there are 64 genome-wide significant loci, 33 of which are novel for bipolar disorder. Here the novel loci are shown in yellow. We saw strong replication of the loci from the PGC2 paper with uh, 28 out of those 30 loci replicating here. And we also saw replication of the ODZ4 locus from the PGC1 paper and a few uh, other loci from published GWAS on bipolar. 
SNP heritability here was 18.5% on the liability scale, which is a small decrease compared with PGC2, where um, the estimate was up to 23%. Um, and just to um, give you a bit uh, further information on that, um, here I'm showing the SNP heritability estimates per wave of uh, PGC bipolar and what we can see is that we see lower heritability estimates from some of the newer waves that have been included more recently and um, so the highest SNP heritability seen is in the PGC1 samples and these were mainly cases of type 1 bipolar disorder. If we look at the psych chip samples, um, the estimate was 17%. There is a larger proportion of type 2 cases in psych chip compared with PGC one or two. Um, I estimate about one to two percent of the decrease is due to the actual chip, but it's mainly the type of cases that are included uh, within this wave. And then we saw the lowest heritability estimate from the external data sets. And we don't have detailed information on those, but I think we could speculate perhaps they um, are cases with less severe illness than our clinically ascertained cohorts um, or maybe a more heterogeneous population. So this is the reason that the overall SNP heritability estimate decreases in PGC3. However, despite this, as I'm showing here, there is a high genetic correlation between all of the waves with a weight of mean of 0.94. So this supports meta-analyzing these cohorts, which have different subtype uh, proportions of the subtypes or have been ascertained in different ways um, to increase power for risk locus discovery. Taking a look at the novel loci, uh, they are labelled here by the nearest gene to the index SNP. The MHC is now genome-wide significant for bipolar disorder. Um, other notable novel associations here are the CAC and B2 calcium channel. Um, this here is a potassium channel. The furin gene has um, a neurodevelopmental role and it's well known for its involvement in schizophrenia. Um, and many of these novel loci have been associated with schizophrenia in GWAS um, at genome-wide significance. And a couple of them now have also been associated with major depression. So we're starting to see the first overlap uh, between the mood disorders in terms of the actual genome-wide significant low side. And we've integrated EQTL data with our GWAS results, which I'll show later. And we're also in the process of doing statistical fine mapping of these GWAS signals in order to prioritize the most likely causal genes within these low side. This is how the signal looks in the MHC in bipolar disorder compared with schizophrenia, which is shown below. So in bipolar disorder, we see one signal across the extended MHC. We don't see that second peak around the C4 genes that was seen in schizophrenia. And we've collaborated with the McCarroll lab to impute the C4 structural variance and C4 expression levels using our genotype data and a new C4 imputation reference panel that they have developed. And there was no association between the C4 structural variance or genetically predicted C4A expression with bipolar disorder. So while the MHC is involved, it's unlikely to be driven by C4 in bipolar disorder. We did a series of enrichment analyses to look at signal enrichment in the GWAS results. So here I'm showing the results of the MAGMA gene set analysis. There were 10 significant gene sets, all of them involved synaptic activity, neurogenesis or calcium signaling. And looking at gene expression, there was enrichment in genes expressed in all of the brain tissues from GTEx and no other tissue types with the strongest enrichment in the prefrontal cortex. In terms of the specific cell types involved, these are the results of the cell-specific enrichment analyses. So here we've used five publicly available human and mouse single cell data sets, and uh, we're looking at the top 10% of genes most specifically expressed in each cell type compared with all other cell types in the data set. And the biggest enrichment we see is in neurons in the cortex, but also in several other brain regions. And we see this enrichment in both excitation and inhibitory neurons and there are a couple of enrichments in astrocytes in one of the data sets but it's predominantly neurons that we're seeing um, and aside from the 
cortex, the second um, area where we saw the most enrichment was in the hippocampus um, with enrichment in um, medium spiny neurons and interneurons. So these are findings that are similar to um, what's been shown in schizophrenia. We looked at enrichment in the gene targets of different classes of drugs. Um, we tested about 150 classes, um, which are grouped here according to their ATC codes. And um, we saw significant enrichment in four classes of drugs at the very broadest level, uh, the top class being the psycholeptics. And these are defined as drugs that have a calming effect on behavior. The most enriched subclass of the psycholeptics was antipsychotics and this group also includes the mood stabilizers such as lithium. So it's reassuring that we reliably detect enrichment in the targets of the known bipolar disorder treatments here. But we also see enrichment in the targets of calcium channel blockers, which are used for treating hypertension and um, drugs for treating uh, GI disorders, which include many anticholinergic and serotonergic drugs, and also in the targets of anti-epileptics. So these results point towards new therapeutic leads and potential opportunities for repositioning some classes of drugs as treatments for bipolar disorder. We've integrated eQTL data in several ways with our GWAS results to prioritize biologically relevant genes. Firstly, we use the TWAS fusion method and data from the PsycEncode consortium who have uh, measured gene expression in over 1300 brain samples. And using TWAS fusion, we saw 77 TWAS significant genes, meaning that bipolar disorder risk alleles affect the expression of these genes in the brain. And they were clustered within 40 distinct regions. So we do see correlation of the um, predicted effect on gene expression um, with more than one TWAS signal per region and this motivated us to then try to fine map those TWAS signals. And for this we used a tool called FOCUS which is a Bayesian TWAS fine mapping tool and it models the correlation among the TWAS signals and assigns a posterior probability to each gene for being causal. So what I'm showing here are 32 genes that were fine mapped by FOCUS and had a posterior probability of greater than 0.7. And as a further sensitivity analysis, we also investigated those genes using SMR or summary database Mendelian randomization. Um, for that, we used like ENCODE data and also data from EQTL gen, which is a large blood uh, gene expression reference panel available. And one thing that SMR does, um, which the other methods don't do, is that it applies the HIDE test, which suggests the causal role of SNPs on bipolar disorder via gene expression. Um, so here are 15 genes which were SMR significant and passed the HIDE test. So these are 15 high confidence genes um, which have robust evidence for their involvement in bipolar disorder via gene expression. And we have several interesting genes here, for example, HTR6 and MCHR1. These are receptors and they are known to be targeted by existing antipsychotic drugs. Decreased expression of furin is also associated with bipolar disorder as it is in schizophrenia. And this gene has already been the target of many functional follow-up experiments uh, since it was associated with schizophrenia in GWAS. And another gene I'll mention is DCLK3. This is a gene that's upstream of TRANK1, a gene that's long been associated with bipolar disorder. And these genes share many EQTLs, but from our analyses, we're seeing a stronger effect of the EQTLs on DCLK3 compared with TRANK1. So these are 15 uh, promising candidate genes for uh, future functional follow-up experiments in bipolar disorder. Polygenic scores from the new GWAS results explained on average 4.75% of variance in European samples and this is based on a series of leave one out polygenic scoring analyses across all of the samples in our meta-analysis. 
we were also able to look into performance in some non-European samples through collaboration and um, we saw approximately 2% variance explained in two East Asian samples that we looked at and half a percent in two African American samples and that's a large improvement uh, compared with using the PGC2 polygenic score in those samples um, and currently the polygenic score from this GWAS freeze is um, the best for use in non-European data sets because it's much larger than any of the um, non-European GWAS of bipolar disorder that are currently available. And then within our European data sets, um, here I'm showing the average R squared across within each wave. Um, and the average was 4.75, but we saw higher R squared in the PGC 1, 2, and 3 data sets. Again, we saw a lower R squared in the external studies. So these results are in keeping with the SNP heritability estimates um, that I showed, and it's possible to see an R squared upwards of 6%, depending on the characteristics of the target data set that uh, the polygenic score is used in. So these are the key findings from the PGC3 freeze. Uh, the figure here is showing the number of loci versus our sample size. And um, it's fair to say that we have reached the inflection point now in GWAS with bipolar disorder, and we're expecting a large return on our increase in sample size going forward in PGC4. Um, one thing I did want to highlight, though, is that we have a roughly similar sample size to the um, schizophrenia study. This is the meta-analysis of PGC2 plus CLAS UK. Um, yet we have far fewer genome-wide significant loci in the current freeze compared with that study. Um, and one reason for this could be that we see a lower SNP heritability in our data compared um, with the estimate in schizophrenia, which makes um, risk locus discovery more challenging. Um, and that could be due to the subtypes um, that exist within bipolar disorder and the heterogeneity um, that is within the disorder. So while we've reached the inflection point, we're seeing a trajectory of risk locus discovery that's something in between uh, major depression and schizophrenia. Uh, we, here we've prioritized 15 promising genes for functional follow-up studies and uh, we see many lines of evidence from this uh, study pointing towards the involvement of calcium signaling in bipolar disorder which could be an interesting avenue for future therapeutic development. So these are all of the people involved and I'd like to thank everyone in the group, the PIs who provided the data and all of the analysts who have um, been working on this. We're currently um, preparing the manuscript, so hopefully you'll see a preprint um, towards the end of the summer with the full results. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Neve. Uh, so now uh, it's open for questions. There's already one comment in the chat about the drug um, repurposing. So the direction of effect there is, is uh, can you get that from the data here? Do you know that, Neve? Or Silvio Ali, maybe you can comment. So we're not looking at a direction of effect in the data, we're just looking at enrichment of the bipolar disorder signal in the genes um, that are targeted by those classes of drugs. Um, so yeah, there's no direction of effect um, from those results. Exactly. It's open for questions now for Neve. So uh, just a, a quick uh, question here. So what do you think about these uh, interesting MHC findings? Do you think it was a power issue that we didn't uh, find anything last time? Or, or, or if this is a more like severe type, more like schizophrenia, like then we were less likely to find it now since we have more bipolar 2 in this sample. So c can you explain or can you have you some thoughts about that? Yeah, the bipolar, uh, the MHC signal is actually um, particularly strong in the PGC3 freeze and uh, it is a novel locus we didn't observe it the last time. And um, from digging into the locus, it certainly looks like it's not um, 
driven by C4. So there's some different biology going on there compared with schizophrenia. Um, and I believe um, similar um, things are seen in major depression. So it could be, as you said, that we have added more type 2 bipolar disorder cases in this wave, um, which we know are more genetically similar to depression. Um, and now we have the power to detect that signal um, in this wave. Yeah, so just uh, thank you. Just a little uh, technical note here. So if you want to ask questions, you need to unmute yourself. It's possible to do that now. It, so either uh, write the chat or, or or let us know. Uh, if you want to, to have a question or comment, but there will be plenty of uh, opportunities after Kevin's and also at the end. So thanks a lot, Neve. Great data, great presentation. And let's move on to Kevin O'Connell. Uh, you are the head of our secondary projects uh, and uh, you are going to show some results from uh, the overlapping genetic architecture from some of these secondary proposals, please. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Um, so to start with, I'm actually just going to hijack the brainstorm paper from 2018 um, and just update that with some of the uh, new findings on genetic correlations from the latest trees that Neve just presented. Um, so when we look at uh, psychiatric disorders, we now have uh, significant correlations with um, anorexia nervosa and uh, autism, as well as anxiety um, in the UK biobank, um, that anxiety and panic disorder trait there. Um, so we're really starting to sort of fill out um, this grid of genetic correlations with other psychiatric phenotypes. Um, in contrast, when looking at neurological phenotypes, um, we still see very little genetic correlation here um, across the board. Um, and then when looking at more sort of general behavioral and cognitive phenotypes, um, we have a few uh, new interesting findings with neuroticism and um, some smoking phenotypes, um, which are now significant. Um, but these are uh, just genetic correlations. And so here, I want to just uh, go on a small tangent, looking at the relationship of bipolar disorder with educational attainment and intelligence um, to sort of contrast genetic correlations with genetic overlap. So what we see from the genetic correlations is that both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have a positive correlation with um, educational attainment or years of, of education. Um, and only schizophrenia has a negative uh, correlation with intelligence. Um, while the correlation for bipolar disorder um, is slightly negative um, and very close to, to zero. Um, but the interesting thing is that educational attainment has an extremely strongly uh, positive um, correlation with intelligence. And so there's clearly a very sort of complicated relationship going on here um, beyond just uh, genetic correlations. And if we look at uh, some sort of uh, clinical data, it's been shown that um, schooling performance or a poor school performance is associated with an increased risk of schizophrenia. Um, but with bipolar disorder, there's almost a, a U-shaped sort of relationship here where both poor and good performance are associated with bipolar disorder. Um, and so this negative um, trend in the phenotypic data supports what we observe at the genetic level. And to some degree, this, um, this U-shaped pattern might also uh, explain why we don't get a correlation with bipolar disorder. Um, and so to sort of further emphasize that, um, I just want to consider just a very simple um, sort of uh, explanation 
of genetic overlap. So if we have two traits here, and each with a few causal variants labeled in red, um, if the direction of effect for those variants is the same, or predominantly the same, we will get a, a positive correlation. Um, if the directions are in the opposite direction, we'll get a negative correlation. And if there is no uh, uh, overlap between the causal variants, then we of course will get no um, genetic correlation, no genetic overlap. Um, but um, it's also um, sort of feasible that there's this fourth model um, where we can have genetic overlap without genetic correlation, um, where you have, say, 50% of your genetic variants have direct uh, the same effect direction, and 50% have the opposite effect direction, and they would essentially cancel each other out. Um, and in fact, this model here can actually uh, also explain positive and negative correlations. You just have to have slightly more of one type than the other. Um, and so this, this sort of ex or may explain how we can get genetic overlap without genetic correlation. And it's something to consider when we think about the interaction or the, the relationship between bipolar disorder and intelligence. Um, and at our group here in, uh, in Oslo at, at Normand, um, we have used um, an older approach, uh, conditional F, uh, conjunctional FDR approach, to uh, try and look at this uh, concept of genetic overlap beyond genetic correlation. And so using this method, we see here that um, by conditioning bipolar disorder on intelligence, so as we increase the significance of SNPs for intelligence, we get a, a leftward uh, upward leftward deflection of the QQ plots indicating um, some cross trait uh, enrichment. Um, and uh, using a conjunctional FDR, we're able to identify 12 shared loci between bipolar disorder and intelligence. Um, more recently, um, Alexander Frey uh, published last year in Nature Communications um, the uh, mixer model, um, which employs a causa mixture model to look at polygenic overlap. Um, and one of the main outputs are these really nice uh, Venn diagrams, um, which just estimate the quantity of shared and trait specific variants in thousands, um, with the size of the circles indicating the polygenicity um, of the trait. And the sort of um, math uh, or the model behind this is that if we plot the effects um, of variants for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia in this example, um, bipolar disorder along the x-axis and schizophrenia along the y-axis, we will see that um, there are some variants that have zero effect for schizophrenia and only have effect in bipolar disorder and vice versa. Um, and then we also get this um, this positive uh, sloping line where the variants have the same effect direction in both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And we can see that um, in the model data here um, and the z-scores. Um, we get this sort of right-leaning um, oval. And so using this uh, new mixer model, we went back and looked at bipolar disorder and intelligence. And indeed, despite uh, uh, very little correlation between these phenotypes, we do see substantial genetic overlap. Um, I just want to show height here as an example where we have no genetic correlation and very little um, genetic overlap. And so in this case, um, looking at bipolar disorder variants, um, there are very few that influence, uh, that influence height and, and vice versa. Um, so we have a very uh, marginal overlap here, and this is represented in the data here as well. Um, when we look at um, the psychiatric phenotypes, again, um, we can see um, some, some interesting uh, patterns. So 
despite having similar genetic correlations, um, ADHD and autism see, seem to have slightly different genetic overlap with bipolar disorder, um, with more overlap seen for ADHD. Um, and then very interesting with depression, despite having a much lower, um, although still um, strongly positive genetic correlation, we see here that almost all of the bipolar or almost all of the variants that influence bipolar disorder also are predicted to influence um, major depression. Um, and then when looking at uh, mood instability, which is a GWAS published um, last year um, by Ward et al., um, we now get a, a positive significant genetic correlation, whereas in that paper using the PGC2 data, um, it was not significant. Um, but we also observe a much greater um, genetic overlap than um, what might initially be expected based on that correlation. And so sort of looking under the hood of this data, um, we can see that it's more uh, of a circle uh, in a way, the data, as opposed to a, a sort of positive oval, like what we see in um, schizophrenia and bipolar. And so the mixed direction of effects um, that's present here might explain the low genetic correlation um, that was not expected. Um, I'm going to just present a few more uh, phenotypes, um, which along with mood instability, we, we chose to focus on in the PGC3 paper. Um, so these include some sleep-related phenotypes. Um, and so again here, um, we do have uh, quite low genetic correlations, although a number of them are significant. Um, we do see, though, um, still substantial genetic overlap with these sleep phenotypes. Um, and when looking at some behavioral and cognitive phenotypes, um, such as smoking on the top left here, um, we see a very large overlap um, there. Um, very interesting that cigarettes per day is doesn't seem to be particularly polygenic. Um, very interesting with bipolar disorder and educational attainment that again, we uh, see that this, uh, all of the variants estimated to influence bipolar are also estimated to influence educational attainment. Um, and then when looking at some alcohol um, related phenotypes, we see um, some genetic overlap with drinks per week, problematic alcohol use, and alcohol use disorder. Um, Naomi Ray and, and her team um, then looked at some Mendelian randomization uh, analysis uh, based on these phenotypes um, using GSMR. And we identified some um, interesting relationships here that definitely um, warrant sort of further investigations. Um, so bipolar disorder, seems to uh, be causal for a decreased likelihood of being a morning person. Um, and um, of course, here we use causal in inverted brackets because um, these relationships are um, definitely more complex than that and, and need uh, to be further investigated. Um, but we see bidirectional relationships with sleep, and problematic alcohol use, as well as educational attainment and mood instability. Um, although mood instability does seem to have a larger effect on bipolar disorder than um, the inverse. Um, and then we see that um, smoking initiation and cigarettes per day seem to drive bipolar disorder, um, but that bipolar disorder does not um, affect those phenotypes. So, some, uh, I guess, implications or conclusions. Um, we have opportunities now to better characterize genetic overlap um, to help to improve our understanding of the genetic architecture of bipolar disorder. Um, and so genetic correlations only tell some of the story. Um, if we look at bipolar disorder and schizophrenia versus bipolar disorder and, and uh, major depression, we see much greater overlap with which with major depression than expected based on the genetic correlation. Um, and then we can also look at genetic overlap without genetic correlation. So we can go back and take a look, a second look at, at previous findings or 
um, those white squares from the um, from the heat maps in the brainstorm paper, um, especially um, the neurological phenotypes might be something that um, could be very interesting to investigate now. Um, and this idea of genetic overlap without genetic correlation helps to explain some odd results such as bipolar disorder and intelligence. Um, in general, then, we identify substantial overlap between uh, most of the complex phenotypes here with bipolar disorder, um, suggesting that there's likely common pathways or mechanisms underlying um, all of these brain-related phenotypes. Um, and so it might be potentially more interesting to try and identify or characterize trait-specific components um, instead of the overlapping um, components um, when looking at two phenotypes. Um, and then again, we have established causal relationships with BD, but these um, uh, highlight potentially modifiable risk factors which warrant more detailed uh, investigations. Um, and so then to end, I'd just like to acknowledge the bipolar group, uh, especially Neve, who did uh, all the work generating this, this new data for us, um, as well as the precision psychiatry group here at Normand, um, especially Alex Bray, who um, is the main, the main developer of Mixer. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That was uh, a lot of results there. And uh, uh, now, uh, if you send a question in the chat box or unmute yourself, we can have uh, some questions for Kevin. I just, while people are waiting, so could you say something? Uh, it was hard to sort of grasp the whole thing here, but do you see, to me, it looks like there is a pattern that uh, overlapping uh, signal seems to follow the, there's some kind of a uh, makes sense also compared to the SMR results um, yeah yeah I think uh, like um, I think we see more um, genetic overlap when we have these sort of bi-directional um relationships um whereas uh when it's more these uh, unidirectional relationships um then it, it seems like one of the traits sort of um is much more dominant in the in the model um especially looking at uh, like cpd for example um and some of these alcohol traits um Yeah, and then there's a question here. I can read it for you, Kevin. So yep. how does genetic overlap interact with bipolar one versus two? Are there plans to look into them separately? This is uh, an important finding from uh, the 2019 Eli Stahl paper. That's, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, um, Mixer requires the GWAS results to be um, reasonably well-powered. And so um, we don't really have the sample sizes yet um, when looking at the subtypes. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can do um, in the future now, um, as we sort of tease out the subtypes in the um, PGC3 datasets and in any new datasets that come in. Yeah. But I think in the Eli Stahl paper, we did the progenic risk scoring and saw a clear pattern that bipolar one was always more associated with schizophrenia while two with depression. Yeah, that with would certainly be the hypothesis, yeah. So you are planning on doing this now with the follow-up studies if we get enough samples. Absolutely, I think that would be super interesting. Thanks, that was interesting. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I then think we 
should move on. So I have prepared some slides just to give an overview and discuss some plans. Can you see my screen now? Good. So, um, just some uh, some comments for for uh, for, for uh, to wrap up the, the talk today and give people a, a little bit of an overview of what we are doing and and the plans for uh, for the future. So. This is the team. This was a picture taken in um, the World Congress a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, this year only on the digital meetings, but we have been uh, sort of the Zooming uh, system has worked well. So we had some progress in, in the bipolar team the last year. And uh, you heard about uh, the novel findings uh, from Neeb. And that, as she said, this paper is probably being uh, made available now in a couple of months. You just need to finalize it in QC and 64 loci. That's quite uh, interesting. So then I just want uh, to discuss a bit about the potential for gene discoveries and why we need more samples. So this is... Uh, based on uh, these mathematical models of the genome. And on the y-axis, you see the percent variance explained by the genome-wide significant SNPs. And then the x-axis is the sample size. And for comparison, the blue line here, that is height. And current sample sizes there, it is like 80% of um, the, the genome-wide significant SNPs are discovered. So collecting more samples for, uh, for height is not, uh, there are diminishing returns there. But for, uh, for um, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, you can see here that the, we, we have a lot to gain. So we are now at the, what do you call it? This was a 2019 paper. This is roughly that. And this is uh, the current uh, paper now. And then this is the, what we call it, the deflection point that we, now you don't need that much bigger samples to really boost the discovery. So that is really what we are working on now. And this, the, the point here is that the, uh, it is not only heritability that defines how easy it is to discover a, a locus, it's also the polygenicity. So if the heritability is spread out on very uh, many loci, then each loci has a lower discoverability. And this is, for example, in, uh, in MDD, the major depression, the, it's both uh, more polygenic and lower heritability. That's why you need even more samples in uh, major depression. But still, it, it's uh, with the current uh, speed of the PGC now, it, we, we will soon get to quite extensive uh, percentages of uh, explained uh, the variance here. So this is uh, just a quick update of the current samples, uh, uh, Nee presented the bipolar 3 sample, 42,000 cases, 372,000 controls. So then we have been adding data, including a big sample from 23andMe, uh, roughly 90,000 cases and 2 million controls. So we are now preliminary data from 130,000 cases and 2 0.4 million controls. And then we are, hopefully, we, we would from that figure, we are uh, hopefully increasing the discovery even more. And this is very preliminary, so it's not QC or anything. So, but we now have more, roughly 220 GWAS loci. Of course, we need to do uh, 
all kind of uh, cleaning of the data and quality control. So it, we have uh, in the will the next like half a year really improve the discovery in bipolar disorder significantly. And then what is also quite interesting is that uh, we are doing here now some preliminary follow-up analysis and it seems like this self-reported population sample is, um, is more similar to depression than to team. They seem to suggest that this could be the case that people with less severe bipolar disorder, they are not in hospital, not with severe main in the, in the population. So this is something we are really following up on and, uh, and, and uh, working now as the next step after we have the uh, Neves paper being uh, finalized. And then uh, people uh, out there, if you have samples, now is the time. So with all these new exciting findings, there is a lot of potential now to really make a breakthrough uh, in understanding of the genetic architecture. So uh, we also have, uh, in addition to what we have um, shown here, some samples in the pipeline that will increase the, the sample size even more. And then we are particularly interested in uh, how uh, bipolar disorder and genetics are uh, involved in different ancestries. I think this is really an important uh, point. We, we have now, you know, in the bipolar disorder community, uh, samples across the world and we're really pushing to coordinate that to, so we can really figure out what or how are the differences in different um, populations. So this is a big uh, part of the work. What are we also, in addition to uh, increasing sample size across ancestries, we, we are also collecting uh, different samples from, uh, you know, some from biobanks, populations, clinics, and also these self-reports. Like in UK Biobank, there are different um, types of, um, of these um, um, sort of uh, ascertainment types. That is quite interesting to see how that is related to the clinic. Then we are, are applying novel analytical approaches for, for understanding more of the ancestry independent architecture. And then really this dissecting the phenotypes. We had uh, uh, some interesting uh, previous findings there across different the PGC groups. And these, the mood and psychosis spectra in both directions is something that we will uh, be able to dissect mo much better now. And also, as you shown, uh, I think 50% of people with, uh, with uh, bipolar disorder, uh, they have uh, comorbid substance abuse. And also, there's a lot of anxiety in, uh, in people with uh, bipolar disorder. So these are really interesting uh, phenotypes we, we are looking more into. And then there are some rare variance initiatives. We are, are reaching out and, and coordinating activities there. And then we also have the big brain imaging uh, network, the Enigma. And several of the bipolar disorder um, participants that are in the PGC are also in the big Enigma. And I think they presented some results here at the Worldwide Lab a couple of weeks ago. And then what we really want is to, uh, one thing is biology, do discoveries there, but trying to see how we can get from big data to clinical impact. 
and and uh, I know in schizophrenia there is now even a better prediction performance, still far from clinical utility. But how this can help X ratification treatment seems to be the most uh, sort of uh, not the low hanging fruit, but at least it's it seems to be more possible to do within a reasonable time frame. And here we are also working with uh, Conigen, the lithium uh, treatment uh, consortia, which is also global. So then I will uh, uh, end here and there will be uh, room for a question. I think we have a great analytical team now with Kevin and Eve doing uh, excellent work. And then uh, the core uh, sort of executive uh, team of uh, the bipolar disorder working group are doing an excellent job. In addition, we have now uh, also managed to uh, get a lot of interest and a lot of important input from clinicians around the world. That when we now move into dissecting the phenotypes, I think that's going to be really, really important. So I think then we can, um, that's all for me now. So maybe we can open and have the last uh, five minutes for questions and comments to the whole team, the, the whole panel. So if there are, um, I think I'll stop sharing here. Now, please let me know if there are any questions. Um, there are several ones here. Yes, um, uh, maybe you can unmute. And then, um, uh, David, you have some uh, questions to all panelists. I can read them also. Uh, what can we be doing? That's for, for uh, Kevin and Neve. What can we be doing to better understand the biological significance of all the significant hits which we already have? Why do you need to find more hits if we can't understand the biology of the current ones? Please, maybe you need. Yeah, I think that um, several of the analyses that we've already done for the PGC3 um, paper have been informative there, such as imputing the C4 um, variance in expression, although that said more about what's not going on there than what is going on. But um, the EQTL data has been really informative um, and we've been very stringent with our criteria and we've been able to prioritize these 15 high confidence genes. Um, and, you know, many of them have just as much support as genes that have already been prioritized and followed up in functional genomics experiments from the schizophrenia G was. Um, one limitation of um, the EQTL analyses that we've done is that we've used the psych encode data with um, the different methods that we used and so there's going to be some similarity in the results across them so I think going forward it would be really useful um, as more large gene expression data sets become available to be able to um, have independent data sets to prioritize um, genes from um, and to be able to look at other sort of epigenetic marks besides gene expression and then as I mentioned we are also in the process of doing the statistical fine mapping of the GWAS signals we don't have those results yet but um, we hope that we'll be able to um, use this sort of method to um, prioritize more of the causal variants and the causal genes. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. So what, how can we talk about uh, clinical relevance or any impact when we have so few outside of Europe? Like this is David Curtis. That's a very good point. So Kevin, maybe you have some comments uh, on Ole, that. Can yep. you hear me? Ole, so yep. it, isn't, it isn't about gene discovery. It's, it's specifically about prediction. You're talking about a predictor score. That's my concern. I don't mind. We can use white samples to to discover new genes and understand pathology, but we're at a terrible risk that we, if we're talking about having a clinical predictor, we will have a predictor that only works in white people. And what are we going to do? Do we want to be in that situation? And what no. do we want to do to see that we're not in that situation? Okay. Yeah, so they, this is an excellent point. I think so. This is uh, like uh, we are really pushing to get uh, 
other samples from other ethnic ancestries. And that is going to be a, a major, what do you say, uh, uh, ethical or, or, you know, we need to make a difference there. We cannot just continue uh, developing these uh, tools and predictors and everything for, for specific European uh, ethnicities or ancestries. So, oh, Ole, it, can I add to that, please? So there was a paper on this issue. I think it was Alicia Martin. I think it was in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And I think it was 2019 where she actually documented this empirically that the predictive capacity is not great if you go from a European predominant sample to any other ancestry. As part of that, in the PGC4 grant, we've made this a major initiative. Um, there's multiple uh, things going on right now where we're trying to actually get much, much larger sample sizes from all of the representative samples from the world. So I think David's point is spot on and we're working on it. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Um, and I, th I think now uh, w with um, the 23 and Me data, with, I know there are also some collections of the places that we may get in the position to have much bigger samples from different ancestries. Uh, what, uh, and then uh, maybe a question for you, Kevin, then, um, what, what were this? Yeah, the, the, do you think that the genetic heterogeneity of bipolar disorder and current psychiatric nosology can contribute to inconsistent results and the small amount of variance explained. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think Neve sort of even showed that in, in the data that <clears throat> um, as we move towards these uh, population samples as opposed to the uh, clinically ascertained samples, that the heritability does go down, which would indicate that there is some more heterogeneity in the sample. Um, and it is a particularly a challenge for bipolar considering the phenotypic heterogeneity on top of that, that we'll have to deal with uh, going forward. Um, as Ulla mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we do have a group um, sort of dedicated to uh, trying to tease out uh, subtypes and subphenotypes from the data. Um, and so that work's probably gonna be very important um, as we go forward. I Certainly agree. And I think uh, I can see also some clinicians here on the talk today. And I think this is going to be very important how we can translate these uh, findings into something that is relevant for, for patients. And I think that is uh, not only from one continent, but, but globally. So are there any other, yeah, some questions about the machine learning. I think that is, um, uh, if, yeah, so uh, there's a paper here in the, in the chat box, if you're interested. Uh, the, the paper by Alicia Martin et al. about um, cross ancestry genetics that Pat mentioned. So, uh that is uh, i think we had one hour are there any final comments or questions from panelists or the audience i think we then uh call the day uh, uh Oli, just wanted to say yeah. thank you to you and the team for the great work it's really fantastic to see this moving in such a robust direction. Thank you. And thank you all for listening and uh, particularly all of you who contribute data to this. And it's, it's really um, amazing to see now that we are getting so much uh, improvement. And uh, thanks to Kevin and Neve for uh, excellent presentation and doing all the work in, in the analysis. Uh, group together with uh, all the people listed. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in this work and it, it's very fruitful uh, job to do. So uh, 
thank you all. Uh, have a great weekend, those of you who are end of the day. And uh, we will uh, be updating you with um, these findings. And if you have any, know anybody with more samples, now we have a time before the freeze to, to uh, join. Thank you all.